Welcome to Escalate Data. Hey everybody, and welcome to my desk. Happy evening. Um, it's the end of a, of a nice uh, weekend. Next week is Circuit Python week. Don't forget. Yeah, Who's special that? show and tell on Friday at 7.30 p.m. Ask an Engineer at 8 p.m. These are all Eastern times. And also, all of our shows and all of our team will be doing festivities and more throughout the day. Check us out on Discord, all the social media places, YouTube, probably where you're watching this now. It's a big old day of celebrating Python on hardware. Come on by. Enjoy. Yeah. Okay, so we're at my desk. You can see stuff scrolling by. Um, so I thought I would show some of the stuff I've been hacking on that's not like hardware, but it's actually kind of software-y because um, this is actually a, a, a lot of my time is spent when I'm not doing hardware is fighting with software. And um, in this case, I was, you know, I, I recently finished the design for this Metro S3. Um, maybe we can go to the overhead and I'll show it off real fast. Um, okay, so focus in. Um, so the Metro S3 is a um, ESP32 S3 Metro. And whenever I make these Metro boards, um, you know, these uh, all-in-one Arduino-shaped boards, I try to like stuff as much can Billy into them so that they're they're good for developing um, new software that then we can port over to you know a smaller um, feather board that doesn't have as many pins, it doesn't have JTAG connectors, etc. Um, so uh, you know DC power and USB micro SD card. This is my new favorite micro SD card slot. It's like the Molex. It's such a great quality uh, card. We we covered this in the Great Search a couple like two years ago, but um, ever since then I've been using it on everything. LiPo battery, uh, five volt DC um, from the DC jack, um, uh, debug pins here for the hardware UART, um, RX and TX, which we'll use for this project, SWD, SWQT, reset button, boot button, and LiPo monitoring. So, you know, jam packed and um, a lot of memory, um, both flash, 16 megabytes, and PS RAM, eight megabytes. And that's a lot for our. ESP32 S3 feathers, normally I do the Metro first, but like because of part shortages, this actually got delayed. For the feather, I don't use the big room module. I use the smaller mini module that only has four megabytes of flash and two megabytes of PS RAM, which is still like a huge amount compared to most microcontrollers. Um, but again, you know, this is super chunky and they make even bigger ones too. I think they make a 32 megabyte flash uh 16 megabyte ps ram but like the pricing does get a little bit high and i'm like well do people really need that much are they willing to pay for it i think this is very nice and chunky uh you can run uh, tft screens you can run emulators um you know you have a lot of, of space and one thing that's kind of neat is that there's also a uc linux build for this chip the esp32 s3 um that was done by this person named max and um, ten, apparently the extensive Tensilica chip had already been ported. Like Tensilica is a, a chipset that has been used for processors for a bit. There is a Linux port for it. Um, but what this guy did is um, actually um, do all the patching to make it run on a small microcontroller like this. Now, you know, the first thing I said when like this came up was like, well, there's no memory management unit. When you run code on in ESP32, it run, like everything runs as root. There's no protection from memory. Like any process can touch any address. Um, and that's what you don't want in an operating system. You want to have um, hardware protection uh, so you can do like, you know, page mapping and you can um, have swap and you can um, have uh, rings of protection. Um, I mean, obviously some of that does in software, but having like some hardware assistance with it is like super helpful. Um, but it turns out there's a, a type of Linux, a, a variant called UC Linux that does not use an MMU. And that does have consequences. Like you can't run um, a lot of software on it. And like, I'm kind of learning about this UC Linux. I've never really used it before, but, you know, trying to compile some code for it, for example, I was like, oh, let me try to get links working on it so I can like browse the internet from um, this chip running UC Linux, but it won't compile because it's like, I don't know what fork is. And I'm like, yeah, I guess if you don't have a memory management unit, maybe you can't fork off a, a new process. I think every, all the code is running within like one busy box process or something. I don't know, it's kind of new, it's kind of new to me. Um, anyways, uh, so back to my computer. Uh, 
So I just quick, quick intro. I know I've done a couple of videos on it, but like I have to assume nobody's watching any of the other videos. Yeah. Um, oh, just a notice when we do the um, 10 p.m. shows, it's it, they they try we try to get these out at 10 p.m. because it's funny. Um, but the first two were 10 p.m. on a weekend night, like short even packing around. Yeah. And uh, I think I might have to specify again why we're doing this. It's not saying, "Hey, companies, where's your engineers at 10 p.m." why aren't they working for you company it's actually saying it's 10 p.m do you know where your engineers are because what the engineers are doing for fun is is what's probably coming up next and that's what we're doing is we're celebrating like it is an amazing time to do electronics and engineering and uh since there's a lot of people motivated to be crummy to one another online we're like well someone has to be the voice to celebrate this all so um why not us that's right okay so you can watch those old videos, but we're, I'm going to cover kind of everything. And I'm going into more depth because here I have, you know, like a 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, we're seven minutes in. Okay. So let's go to the computer. So I'll show the script. Um, so this is a script. Uh, eventually I will be able to memorize this JC MV BKBC, uh, which I'm going to call Max because his name is Max or their name is Max. Um, and uh, they have a script for for doing all this build. I mean, they've they've sort of documented it, but now there's this like script that you can go through. And this script absolutely will do the build for you, like 100%, but you do have to have like exactly the kind, the right kind of Linux install to do it. Like um, I'm running Windows because so much electronic software is Windows only. And like, I know a lot of electrical engineers who also running Windows. Like I didn't grow up with Windows. I actually grew up with Linux. I ran like Slackware 1 and NetBSD and then FreeBSD and OpenBSD and then um, a lot more Linux um, and then, um, you know, Mac, OS. But now I'm like to Windows because again, like so many customers use Windows and almost all the software that I need to do my job, it runs in Linux only, it runs in uh, Windows only. Um, so, you know, within, um, if you want to run script like this, there's a couple options in windows. You can use something like MSYS, um, which, you know, I do here. Um, and MSYS is, is actually pretty good. It's, it's like you can, I can compile circuit Python within it. I can do like most AVR GCC builds, but it couldn't do this. I don't remember why it like could not, there, there was something missing or like it, the wrong, whatever version. And then I tried, um, WSL, which is also really great because uh, it shares your file system, but it's like a true Linux build. And this um, does get quite far, but it fails because it, it failed originally because my path had spaces and there was some tool that was like, I can't deal with your, I think the cross tool didn't like that your, my um, path had spaces in it. And I, and I was like, I actually kind of stopped there. Like, and I was like, I'm going to try something else because I figured if that wasn't working, something else wouldn't work. But turns out I just changed the path and it did compile, although it took a very long time under WSL. And then I tried on a Mac and the Mac didn't compile because um, the brew, the homebrew cask of curses was not built with L menu. There was like some, some uh, symbols weren't exported or it wasn't compiled with the menu symbols. I don't, you know, I kind of looked into it and then I was like, I didn't care anymore. Um, and it, you do, you couldn't, you can fix it, but then like you're kind of messing with your homebrew install. And I was like, I really don't want to mess with it. Um, and then I was like, you know, I, you know, I did get eventually working on, on WSL, but one of the issues I have is I can't just have something work for me because I want to write a guide. I want to have a tutorial. I want to be reproducible. I, I like it when there's instructions that are like, look, you'll be able to do this no matter what, when, where, because when you have these very delicate, um, setups to build, like maybe it runs on WSL now, but it won't run after WSL does all these updates and something changes you know, it can be very frustrating for people. And, you know, I, I know I'm not the only one who's had issues doing this build. It's like, it's non-trivial to do um, a cross, a cross compiled build of a UC Linux kernel and build root um, uh, for the Tensilica processor. So, you know, I was thinking, oh, right. Like I've used, I've had this issue before with TensorFlow. If you remember that from four years ago when I was doing TensorFlow Lite micro builds and also would not build on my um windows it wouldn't build on windows it was like very wacky weird reasons very complicated build um using uh the google build system which was like called i don't remember what it was called it had some basil yeah it was like this huge basil thing um 
This is, by the way, why I like CircuitPython, because it's like once it's built, it's like there's no tool chains. So what I decided to do was to make a Docker. And Docker is kind of neat. And it's gotten a lot better and faster in the last couple of years, too, which is great. Um, so Docker is free for personal use. It's not for commercial use. So just be aware of that. Um, and what you do is you can create, just like when we have actions and continuous integration in GitHub, like whenever we commit to CircuitPython or to Arduino, we quickly, um, maybe I'll show this because it's actually kind of for people who maybe don't know about actions. When we um, push, let's see, I'm trying to do, let, let's say, you know, this this library and, and actions. Whenever we commit, we have a um, build CI. Oh, it looks like there's actually a, a bug in this PR. One second. How do you use Windows? Whenever you commit a release, we do a test run that, um, you know, starts up a miniature computer, a virtualized computer that runs Linux. It like boots nearly instantly because it doesn't have like drivers and, and soundboards and whatever. It, you know, boots right, right into memory and it runs a couple commands like here we install, you know, Python and then we, um, um, let's see. Trying to where we actually do the the tests, we check out the repo, and then we run pylint on it. Oh man, sorry, it's been a while since the run CI build workflow. This workflow is huge. Okay, we install this code. We run pylint, and we lint the code, and we run black and uh, YAML checking, and we check that the licensing and all this done is in a, is done in a little micro Linux computer. Um, similar to Docker, to a container. And then as soon as it's done, it disappears. So you, you've created a completely clean environment, run all the commands that you want to run to analyze this data, and then you shut it down. And so you don't have to worry about like, oh no, I have to update my version of Python or like the YAML parser is incompatible with the black parser because of some, you know, argument that they had on GitHub. You don't have to worry about it because everything is kind of frozen into this um crystalline reusable um computer configuration file and that's what docker does so it's something for your home computer where you can quickly create um little miniaturized virtual computers they run very very fast because they don't have you know window management and drivers and all user interfaces and and their file systems are like really minimal but they are minimal um so you do have to configure them and, you, and the configuration is a little bit more in depth than just like plugging in a live CD and you're booting Linux. Um, but if you want to have so, for something like this, where it's like, look, I just want to do one thing. I want to compile this tool chain, maybe configure a couple files. And I don't, I want to have it separate than my setup because um, like a common issue is I have to compile something. Oh no, the version of AVR GCC has to be different. Or the version of Python has to be different. And like now, my computer gets really confused because it's like there's three versions of Python installed and it messes up my personal workflow. So this doesn't, this doesn't mess with your workflow because it's like, again, it's, it's in a little jar. You can, you can take it. So the way you do a, um, Docker, I was just going to show this failing, but whatever, we'll just close this is you create a thing called a Docker file. Um, let's make a new one and I'll show, I'll show kind of how these are done. So you make a new file. And you um you remove the .txt, and then um, I'll just open this up in XEMX. So the first part is that you want to tell it what kind of computer. And I'm just going to copy and paste over from here. Um, what kind of computer you want it to boot? So you know they boot Linux. In this case, I'm I'm going to spec You know I I originally did Debian. Like, it, you know, start with a Debian build. The problem is the Debian build, I found like later, like 99% through, is that in the Debian build comes with Python 3.1.1 and the Espressive toolchain has a bug that doesn't make it work with 3.1.1. You need 3.10, Ubuntu 2.2.04, you know, turns out like you Google it, you're like Docker, Python 3.10, turns out that this Ubuntu works great and it's still supported. And then you have these run commands where you tell it what you want to run. So let's just start with like apt get update. 
And that's like all we're going to do to start. Um, so then in your PowerShell, wait, sorry, I'll uh, open up the new PowerShell. Uh, and then you do, sorry, I'm going to remember the command. It is uh, docker build t maybe docker just build dot um and it like stopped immediately and you're like wait did it actually do something yeah actually that's it it created your image for this new ubuntu build that all it does is an app get update and you can see here it actually it's, it's what's funny is it's cached it knows like oh hey you you had a very similar computer you were building earlier so i'm just gonna like reuse that same set up and then under your images um you'll see this new um uh image that's like that's the crystal right and then you can whatever sprout the crystal i think this is it and then you'll run it and then did i do this correctly uh sorry this is Docker build. Let me make sure I didn't. I don't have the wrong one. Docker T. Hold on. Docker tag. Docker T. Oh, I want to tag it with the name. That's right. I want to tag it with. Uh, desk let's just do that okay and let's uh let's delete this okay back to your images okay so we have this all right so this makes more sense because it was cached from the previous one so this one's small it's only 120 megabytes one nice thing is that it will increase the file system whereas with VirtualBox, you have like you know you try to like set the file system and then like you can run out of disk space okay so you run this and um what's interesting is that it ex it exits immediately and you're like, this is kind of messed me up. I was like, wait, I want to like run commands. I can't. Turns out you have to at the end tell like it actually ran it. And then it's like, I'm done. I'm going to quit now because you didn't tell it to like continue running. It's like when you run a Python script, you have to have a while loop at the end if you want it to keep running. So there's this little um, thing you tell it like, hey, don't um, don't quit. Do this tail F dev null, which means like keep keep running the computer so that I can terminal in. And then you just uh, rebuild. And then in your Docker images, it's like, oh, you know, you have this one that's um, left over. I'll delete this. I'll also delete this cached one. And then I can run this. Okay. And now, I believe, oh, I did not. I have to do something else. Hold on. Okay. What do I have to do? Also, am I saving this in the right directory? Yes. Is it going to run for me? Okay, now it is. Maybe I didn't select the right thing. So now I have a uh, shell. And I'm in this like miniature computer. You know what you can see. Um, inside inside my windows that is, is again, a, a, a miniature machine. Um, and this is handy if I want to like mess with files or like test commands. Because as I was going through and porting over the shell script, um you know let's say you're gonna do um i want to do like the i'll just do the first command to demonstrate it so uh the first command is um to create to uh, build of autoconf the latest version of autoconf you see we w get it we untar it um we do push it was just a cd you know and then configure and make and make install okay not too bad the way you want to do this um in your docker file We'll wrap up here. You can 
you know, it's, it's more of the same. You do want to set up a work directory. So it's like, okay, uh, everything goes into all, all your working is going to be in this one folder. Um, and I just, I use app because every other Docker file seems to use app. And then um, you do a run. And then what you could do is have a run for every command, shell script command. But every time you have the run, like capital run, it starts over kind of clean in like a fresh shell environment. So what you want to do is, um, but it's always in like slash app. What you want to do is have all the commands in order. And then you do a little like and new line break so that they all happen um, logically in order and also gets treated as like one command, which simplifies the size of the um, the Docker, it treats every shell command as like a layer, it seems like. And so you can um, see, you know, it, it's, it saves the state at each one command. So it's better if you kind of group them together logically if possible. So this is like one command. So, okay, we're gonna, you know, tar, and then uh, I'm not gonna do push D because that's kind of a bash thing. Let me just do CD and then config and then this and then make make install okay and then you actually don't have to do pop d because at the end again their next run command is going to start with a clean shell so let's let's see if we can uh so let's let's quit our existing docker <clears throat> i'm gonna delete these so they don't get confusing and that's a nice thing. It's like you just you're like, I don't like the computer to delete it. Like you or it's very instantaneous. OK, so I've saved. Let's rebuild. OK, and then it's it's interesting. The commands in that run. It'll tell you, hey, like I couldn't do it. And it says W get not found just because this is a really, really minimal version of, of Linux. It's not like your Debian or Raspbian build where it comes with like everything built in. A lot of stuff doesn't come with it. And so you have to um a, a lot like it reminded me a lot like a little video game where it's like every little thing that you you need to kind of like set up every little piece so that you can push the marble and it'll go down the path properly so then here you're going to do a run apt get install y w get okay so then you rerun it and it it'll say install e because i miss spelled this okay cool so it's like you're it's doing its you know apt gets and then it fails differently and it says xz cannot exact and then you're like i don't even know what this error is you google it and you find out it's because tar calls for xz files you have to have like x the xz unzipper x unzipper whatever it's called so that's actually uh, XZ utils. Turns out you add that to your apt get install. And then, you know, it, it'll rerun all, every time you change a line, it's going to rerun that line. So it installs, and then it's like I failed on something different. Um, and it's like I can't, I don't have M4. And M4 is like a compiler. It turns out like there's no compiler built in. So you kind of you kind of go through this, and this is where you can like terminal in, because when you terminal in, it might be you know you can run the commands one after the other um, without having to try to craft this like perfect file. But you basically like you know you need um, libtool and git and end curses. Everything has to be built. Like it doesn't come with Python. It doesn't come with um, you know any tool. So you know you need like G plus plus and CMake. Eventually, you know you come up with um, you know this perfect app to get in the beginning that has everything you need for later it'll do all the you know installation and then it's like great you know i'm done and then um we can docker in so let's go in notice it's a lot bigger now it's 600 megabytes we run it and we terminal in and now you'll notice there is autoconf and uh, autoconf is, let me do bash. Um, autoconf has been built and uh, the uh, binaries have been installed. So I can do, you know, autoconf. 
and you can see that it's installed. So now we have this um, this first part of the tool chain installed. So it's not a one to one again. It's not like you can't just paste the shell script in and like you're good to go. You do have to kind of do this matchy matchy part. So it's kind of like took me like, you know, one one baby nap time. I took uh, maybe maybe one and a half going through and adapting all of these instructions to make the Docker file. I'm not going to do the whole thing, but you see how the process starts. But at the end, when you're done, you can push the file to, well, first off, you have the Docker file. Docker file is now here um, under the learning system. I don't know, kind of seemed like that was the right place to put it. I don't want to put it in its own repo. Uh, S3 Linux. And we'll do a little tutorial about this because I think it's interesting. I will say, though, it's like, you know, you're running Linux on this little machine. It does, it's, again, very minimal. You can't do that much. Like, you can run MicroPython because uh, BuildRoot has MicroPython support. Maybe we'll cover BuildRoot next week. Um, but, like, you don't have GPIO access. And, like, the file system is compressed. So, like, you, you can run to temp, but it's, you have Wi-Fi, but it's, like, not that fast, you know. Um, it's a little microcontroller. Um, the Docker file is here. Ironically, it is faster to, like Docker is quite fast, I find. It's almost faster to just run it than to pull the compiled version over the internet down. But if you want, you can actually, I pushed the whole image, like the completed, like, okay, this is done version of the computer to Docker Hub. If you want to go in and you want to do a menu config somewhere in between here and you're like, oh, I want to change the amount of flash, you want to change the host name, all that good stuff, you can do that. Um, it's under Docker Hub and it's here. So I pushed it a couple days ago. It's big. It's a couple, you know, I don't know how much it is. It's like, it's like, you know, 20 gigs. Um, I don't clean up the files because I'm expecting that I'm going to have to re, you know, like I, I, you know, build the cross compiler and I don't delete all of the intermediary files. I don't do make clean because I'm assuming that, um, as you know, people will do ESP32, S3 Linux, there's going to be more, um, like patches and stuff. So, you know, I'll just keep, I keep all the working files there, but you can just download this image and run it immediately. You don't do any of the compilation, but it, it only takes about. 20 minutes to do the entire uh, Docker build. So um, I know that was a kind of like a, a quick intro to, to using Docker, but I think for, for projects like this where, you know, you need to replicate the instructions, um, this is kind of the best way to do it. And even though 20 gigabytes is big, it's way smaller than VirtualBox. Like my VirtualBox, um, when I tried it in VirtualBox, it was like 50 megabytes or something, or 50 gigabytes. And I was like, this is really big and it's like, slower because it's it's you know um a bigger virtualized machine like it's a virtualized computer not just um a virtual linux install one thing that's nice is um docker now use w uses wsl underneath and so it's like you're using your full computer speed it's very very fast you're not like doing this emulation even if it's a very thin layer of emulation um you're still not doing an emulation okay so that's um uh, that's docker for everybody so check it out. Very useful for, for Linux builds in particular. And we'll do some build root stuff um, next week. Phil, you, you need any 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 elucidation or do you think I covered it? No, um, just from you know my point of view, and I'll keep my rant tiny since it's your show. <laughs> it's <just late. laughs> um, there's a lot of like gatekeepy stuff in the Linux world. And what we're trying to do is also make it so if you're new to this, you're not getting yelled at or um, chased away or told you're doing it wrong. Um, I guess we have, quote, a tough skin. So when we see someone do that, we're like, well, let's make it easier for everyone to get more people involved. Because if you look at um, communities that aren't making it, I'm going to say like ham radio, for instance, it's like really difficult to get in. And when you're there, you kind of feel pushed out. And this is what we've heard a ton of times. Um, there's some great people in it, but a lot of it is just like a lot of crankiness. Yeah. So I don't want to see that happen with like Linux. Um, there's, there's, there's enough we all need to do. And uh, for folks to not even be able to start, like everyone was a beginner once. So we think this is, this will help get you past the initial, like, there's no way I'm going to figure this out. And it's just the yak shaving. It's like you're not even yeah. you're not even getting to the fun part yet. You're like, I'm 
installing bin utils. Yeah. I just want to show one last thing because people are going to try to use this on my, you know, you, you build it. Once you're done, you terminal in, in app built release within the Docker image, there's the bootloader bin, network and actor bin, partition bin, and the file system and the kernel image. And then you do need to use ESP tools to burn those files into your ESP32 S3. The network bin, partition table bin, and bootloader bin, you know, I have a example in the Docker file of what you want, like, you know, change it for your port, et cetera. Um, and then you need to use this thing called part tool and it annoy, you know, and it's actually kind of a cute because what happens is the partition table is burnt into the ESP32 S3 to make as much, you know, the kernel is whatever amount of space in one partition. And then immediately after is the file system, or maybe it's the other way around. Um, but you want to make the file system as, as big as possible while making sure that you had enough space for the kernel. And so you need to use part tool, which is in the ESP IDF. And you do, you do have to install the ESP IDF on your computer. You don't have to do any other work with it. And the installer isn't too bad. Like it does run in every operating system. Um, but this reads the partition from the ESP32 S3 and then writes the file system to the correct location. Um, you, I don't want to give you the hard coded numbers because if you do any other tweaks or changes or something, you know, adapt, you know, if you make any adaptations, those partition tables might move. And so you want to use the the proper tool. This is like one thing that took me like an hour to to get where I was like, why do I have to use partition table? Um, that's why, but then you'll then you'll have everything in the right location, and then you can boot uh, boot it up and then uh, just use a USB serial cable because it doesn't go through the USB, uh, native USB. It uses the, the hardware you are is how you connect to the Linux build in the end. Okay, we'll do more um, next week. Okay, so let's go to the great search. Where is the world is that part I need? The Great Search with DigiKey. The Great Search brought to you by DigiKey and Adafruit. Thank you, DigiKey. Every single week, Lady Ada uses the power of engineering to help you. Yes, you find the things that you're looking for, part substitutions, just about anything you could possibly imagine, make, or need on digikey.com. Lady Ada, what is the Great Search of the Week this week? Okay. Um, somebody was asking me about this connector on the ESP32 S3 Metro. Let's go there and I'll show it off. Um, oh, sorry, the uh, overhead. I mean, apologies. Yeah. Um, so on this board, uh, you know, you got your classic Arduino headers and um, the SPI connector, and then there's this. And they're like, what is this connector? What do you, why do you have this here? This is a I call this an SWD connector, but technically that's not correct. It's a JTAG slash SWD connector, but 98% of the time it's for SWD, a single wire debug. Um, this is a two by five, 10 pin shrouded IDC cable that is used on almost every ARM core chip, but also you can use it on like Tensilka with, um, for JTAG debugging. And this is used for trace debugging and like uh, breakpoint debugging. When, you're, when you need something more, better in like memory um, uh, analysis, like you wanna look, look into the memory in the middle of debugging, um, you know, printf debugging is, is pretty common or oscilloscope debugging, I do it all the time. But there's a lot of times where you need something a little bit more powerful. Um, also, on some chips, it's used for the programming part. Um, some chips they don't you can't you don't have a built-in USB bootloader like the, this one does, where you can connect the USB or through UART and uh, bootload immediately. There's a ROM loader. For a lot of chips, they come like blank, blank, blank. You need to load uh, code in. And so, for example, um, you know, here I've got a. Uh, a, a program where this is an Atmel ice and um, you'll notice oh, it's so tough to see but there you go Sam and AVR it uses those connectors as well to this cable and then you can connect here I don't have enough space for a full SWD connector so I just have some wires um, and I have a breakout instead and uh, what I like about this breakout is it also shows you the pins so this is the SWD pinout, uh, which is, you know, power, a bunch of grounds, um, SDIO, SD clock, uh, SDO, which is the actual debugging if you're not just programming, but you want to send data back and forth. Um, I'll put uh, the reset and then I don't know if I have, I don't have the JTAG uh, pinout here, but maybe let's go to the computer and I'll show. Um, 
we do have this SWD. I, you know, we stock in uh, this adapter. It's also available on DigiKey, uh, which also has um, the JTAG pinout. So SWD is a Cortex M0 specific debugging interface. JTAG is the universal one. So the pinout is also used for um, JTAG, where you have, uh, you know, um, MS clock data out, data in for JTAG. And it replaces this original huge connector, this 20 pin connector, which, you know, ha would have a lot more possible data transfer, but um, most people cannot fit these gigantic connectors on their PCBs. It's bigger than the rest of it. Uh, these are much more compact. Um, and let me also, so let me show. So I had the um, AVR uh, SWD. So let me um, show off two more options. Okay, so can you go to the overhead again? I'll just show this quickly. Um, another option is, uh, you know, I showed off this ST debugger. What's interesting about, because I'm, you know, be, later I'll be like, what's what's a two side shroud uh, connector? Um, there are some times where you want to have much more debug data going over. You want like trace data. And uh, Scott actually did a stream um, Friday and last Friday about having a one of these longer connectors. I mean, they look similar, but they're um, they're much longer. Hold on. This is your standard two by two by five connector, and then this is a two by eight, I think, two by eight connector. So it adds another four pins, which is used for uh, more debugging data. And for that reason, you might see, see how it has, it's it's shrouded. So it's got like this two pieces of plastic here for the key and a piece of plastic here to help you orient, but it doesn't have the full shrouding. See how this one has four, let you know, four, um, sides because this longer style connector would not fit in so it's kind of like this is like a backward compatibility mechanical connection but you still want to have the key there's a little key a plastic key here you can you can see this plastic nubbin and then also of course um your your wonderful standard jlink uh jtag and debugging uh, by seger a nice german company and um you can use, uh, in this case, you use a Segger. They have the old connector. You use that adapter, and you go to this cable. Okay, so now I've shown you uh, this cable and the shrouding because that's important. Um, when you choose which one you want, um, if you need to have you know compatibility with this wider shroud. But we're going to just look for this um, kind of standard 2x5 connector. And then um, let's go to the computer again, please. Uh, for our feather NRF, you know, we have, you know, we sometimes stick it on our feathers. It's like, oh, you want to debug it. Um, here you go. And then on the um, Metro RP2040, we also, we have it here. And on the um, Metro uh, SAMD series, uh, sorry, SAMD21. Ditto. I like to, you know, in the metros, I like to put them on there because there's space. Or as feathers, I don't always have space. Although I think the original Feather RP2040 um, has a spot for it. So sometimes I don't put it on, but it's like, because it's like so, it's not really used common. It's not used by beginners and makers. It's often used by more advanced people who are doing the software development. So I put a spot and you can solder it in. And I tend to use the SMT version. But I will say there's a lot of people who use the through hole version of this connector. Okay, so this is a very long intro, but now let's go to DigiKey and find this part. Okay, so we want, just go look under header because it's a header. Um, and you can see even that the default image sort of looks a little bit like what we want. Now, ironically, if you go to this category that has 550,000 different components in it, uh, the first one is actually kind of what we're looking for, but that's just like a total coincidence. Um, and you can see that it has a little pick plate on it. That's the pa plastic piece for the pick in place to be able to pick it up because obviously it's got mostly pins. Um, so these are very, very, very popular uh, headers, but let's pretend that it isn't like the first thing on the list, right? It's just a coincidence. So let's look for active components only. And we want it to have... Uh, the most important thing to watch out for is the pitch. You want it to be 1.27 
millimeters or 0.05 inch pitch. So it's half, half pitch, half of what you're used to, much the smaller. And uh, let's uh, apply. There's a lot, there's a significant number of boards that have that pitch. Um, okay, so we want to have two rows, so it's a two by five, and uh, number of positions, 10. And it's confusing because there's like 10 plus eight flower. Just ignore those. We just want, just want 10. And then um, we also want to do the number of positions loaded. And this is confusing also. Originally, I clicked 10, but that was incorrect. What you want to click is all or dash, which is like, un, you know, unknown. Okay, so we did the pitch. And then you need the row spacing. Sometimes the pitch, like between row pins is not the same as the row spacing it can it can vary we want it to be the same so i'm going to pick uh row row spacing of 1.27 and then in this particular case i'm going to say surface mount but again you can well I'll, I'll do that actually next um the next thing that i do like to select is i want to have gold contacts i feel like these days it's like gold contacts are just so much less likely to oxidize um you know tin tin plate especially lead free tin plate you know it can get a little uh, dusty after a bit um the gold is literally one atom thick so it's not like it's going to add a significant amount of expense but i feel like the quality is much better and then let's go with uh in stock okay so now we can look at some of the options because you see that there's the, the different shrouding i thought that was kind of the most interesting thing to note so first off there's through hole versions I find these annoying to solder. I find the pins are very close. I almost think like the surface mount's easier, but uh, you can get through hole versions of these. Um, you can get right angle. So, you know, sticks out the end. This is like the minimal style. It doesn't have any shrouding at all. However, I find, yeah, these are not cheaper because they're not very common. Let's see if we can find the uh, two shroud yeah here you go so that's sort of what we saw on that um st debugger where you can put in a two by five but then you can have more pins coming out the sides um you know more expensive this is going to be you know about two dollars a piece not like 60 cents so let's go with um surface mount let's see where was that shroud ah here surface mount only and let's say it's shrouded but you know i don't care if it's two wall or, or four wall but i don't want the unshrouded i like to have the little things so you don't plug it in you know backwards i think that's that's wise if you're going to pick a key connector stick with the keying um all right so next up uh let's look by price let's look by price and a couple good options here so um, this comes in tray, so this is for hand placement um, from CNC Tech. But they also have a version that comes on tape and reel, and to be honest, it's not that much more expensive. Um, you know, the individual tray ones, I mean, if you are if you happen to have a pick and place, I can pick it up, but I find it much easier to go with tape and reel. So um, this one is in stock, and it's, you know, 60 cents a piece a good deal and then one thing to watch for is some have little nubbins placement dots let's see if i can i'll show you i think the uh feather rp2040 i'll show you um you see here it has the mounting posts you can select to get ones with mounting posts honestly i've never had an issue where these snap it's to protect you from snapping it off by accident as long as you push down and pull up when you're inserting and don't try to wedge it back and forth you shouldn't have an issue um i don't know if they have yeah they do have board guide here i think it's what's called board guides maybe and shrouds keying shroud mating flange let's see if that gets us ones that have uh nubbins 
Let's see this one. No, does oh, it does have a board guide you can kind of see, I think, with posts. Kind of hard to see, but here is the post. So you can get ones with posts if you so if you so desire. Um looks, these are slightly different keyed versions. You know, the key is in the on the edge there. So this is meant to not be compatible at all, some other connector. Um but you don't really need the keys. So I'm gonna go with this one. This is my pick. 3220 10 300 TR from CNC Tech. A lovely SWD connector. And that's a good church. And thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll see everybody throughout the week. We've got a bunch of stuff going on. Don't forget, Circuit Python Day is this week, Friday, August 18th. All sorts of fun, amazing things to do all day. We'll see everybody this week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks for, for joining us. Longer stream, but I hope you learned a lot. <laughs>